Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Qatar Demisi. Um, Dr. Qatar Demisi serves as the Dean and Professor of the School of Public Health at SUNY Downs State Medical Center. He is nationally recognized for academic public, he is a nationally recognized academic public health leader and researcher in the field of health disparities and minority health, perinatal health, and cancer. He will now introduce our keynote speaker. Hello, Dr. Demisi. Thank you for the introduction and good evening, everybody. It is my great pleasure to welcome and also to introduce Dr. Thomas Lavis as our keynote speaker uh, tonight. Dr. Lavis was scheduled to come and present to us in, in April <coughs> because of the pandemic, it was rescheduled. I had uh, the honor and pleasure of meeting Dr. Lavis first at the Robert Wood Johnson Student Development Workshop where one of my students participated and sub subsequently we met at the Dean's meeting in California and also I'm very happy to see him again this evening. Uh, Dr. Lavis is Dean of uh, one of the most outstanding universities, Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Prior to that, he served as the chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at George Washington University, Milken Institute of School of Public Health. He joined uh, GW after 25 years of faculty at Johns, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where he was the William and Nancy Richardson Professor in Health Policy and founding director of the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solution. Dr. Lavis's research focuses mainly on health equity uh, <clears throat> and he has conducted major studies on cultural competence in healthcare social determinants of health and health policy analysis. And his portfolio is very, very rich in these areas. In addition to his uh, prolific publications, he has uh, an extensive record of uh, publications in scientific uh, journals, as well as uh, writings on the New York Magazine, the Baltimore Sun and other mass media outlets. Uh, he has also the author of several books, extens, ex executive producer and narrator of the scheme you are in. Uh, it is a documentary series about racial inequalities in health that is currently in preparation and production. We'll have the benefit of seeing the segment of the series focused on Brownsville. Dr. Lavist will provide discussion after the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lavist uh, for this uh, uh, presentation and also symposium. Yes, thank you. And thank you, thank you for that introduction. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. Um, and I look forward to our uh, interacting with you in future ASPPH meetings when we are able to meet in person again. Um, also, um, it's good to see you as well, uh, Pam Stryker. Uh, good, to, good, to, good to see you. And always a pleasure to be interacting with people in my hometown of Brooklyn, New York. So uh, I'm often asked the question of how did I come to be a filmmaker? And you know, that was never uh, what I set out to do. Um, and, uh, but the story I think is relevant here and I think is relevant for public health people because we, we have to listen to the, the people that we serve. The work that we do is about serving people and we have to listen to the people. And it actually, when I think about it, uh, uh, it is a story in a sense, in a sense of that. I was at um, dinner with a friend uh, that I'd known for a while, and no offense to anyone here, but you know my 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 friends tend not to be academics, so I was this friend is actually in the music business, and we were, we were at dinner just talking about I don't know football or whatever uh, we were talking about, 
And, and he said to me, he said, you know, I've known you for a while and I know that you're a professor, but what does that actually mean? What do you, what do you do? And so when I get questions like that, I, I usually try to say, make some little clever or at least semi-clever comment and then segue back to talking about football or something else, because I think I'm going to bore people talking about my research or whatever. And, and he used, I had to use every one of my little dodges that I have because he kept asking and I would give him a little quick answer and then he'd say, yeah, but, but really, what, what, do you, what, do you, what does that mean? What do you do? I mean, and, and, and so it was clear that, okay, he really wanted an actual answer and I wasn't going to just, you know, deflect and, and move on to another topic. So I said, okay, let me answer it this way. I said, well, um, I'm writing a book. He said, oh, okay, a book. So tell me about what's the book about? And so I said, okay, um, this is a book about uh, race and health and why it is that African-Americans have a worse health profile than other ethnic groups in the United States. I said, and this book is not, this is not an academic book. If it never makes it into a university library, I'm perfectly happy. And if no academic ever reads the book, that's fine because I'm not writing it to academics. This is for the general public We've been doing all this research for all the, for like three decades now, and there's all this important information locked away at the university library in the academic journals. And what I want to do is take some of that information out, put it into a format that the people can understand and get it out to the public. He says, oh, okay, well, I get that. I understand that. He said, but that's not going to work. I said, well, why? He said, because they're not going to read a book. I said you need to make a movie, and I'm like, well, I don't know how to make a movie, but I know how to write a book, so I'm going to write a book. And so finally, he gave up, and we got back to talking about football. Right. The next morning, I um, was in a meeting with the development officers at Johns Hopkins. They were briefing me to to prep me to go up to New York to meet with a donor. And so they're telling me about the donor and everything, and then they say, okay, well, what are you what are you working on? that might be of interest to this donor. And I said, um, I'm gonna make a documentary. Now, I had no clue what that meant or how you make a documentary or, and this, this idea was in my head for eight hours, right? Last night, I was told I should make a movie. The next morning I woke up and I'm in this meeting. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna make a movie. And then to my surprise, she says, wow. Well, you know, that same day you're in New York, that evening, there's a reception of people from Johns Hopkins in the movie industry. Let me see if I can get you an invitation to this reception. To which I say, there are people from Johns Hopkins in the movie industry? And, and she says, yes, there are. So let me see if I can get you an invitation. So she gets me an invitation to this meeting and I show up at this reception in this, um, this location in Manhattan, the kind of place where um, kids from Brownsville don't ever get to know places like this exist. So I'm walking around in this place with a name tag, and I don't know a single person in the room. But people would walk up to me, look at my, my name tag, and then get this look on their face as if they recognize my name and say, so what's your next project? So I said, okay, well, this is how you do it. So I started walking around and walking up to people, looking at their badge, pretending like I've heard of them and saw their last film. And I'd say, so what's your next project? And I started making these friends in the film industry who ultimately helped me to, to make the film that I'm gonna to present to you today. And, and so the motivation of this film was to, was to unlock this information from the library and try to distill it into a way that um, people can understand and that we could um, get out to the public the information that um, is so often locked away in the library that we produce. So um, as we started shooting, it became clear that this was just too much content for one film, which was the original idea, and that this really needed to be a series. And so we've now completed the first episode of the series. Um, the title is Something About Brownsville. The overall series is called The Skin You're In, and this episode is called Something About Brownsville, which is based on one of the chapters from my book. So I'll, um, I'll stop there and see if I can share my screen. African Americans live sicker and die younger than any other ethnic group in the nation. 
Why would it be that your skin color would determine whether or not you get hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke? How long you'd live? Thank you for coming to share your memories with us. We as African Americans go to funerals like we go to the supermarket, just that frequently. Death is a continuous event in our, in our communities. It is not uncommon for a middle school age child to go to one or two funerals a week. 19, he went into a diabetic coma. It was real tough. For a young black man to say, I'll be lucky if I live past 25, that's a common phrase. When we are lost and sick at heart, we do remember them. My father and my husband, both of them passed away at the age of 40. The two most important male images in your life, passing away at such a young age from cardiovascular related illnesses. No way that this is coincidental. I'm thankful for my life, my health, my strength. I think African Americans have not really grasped that they have control over their health. I thank you for my children. They've only brought joy to me. We accept sugar runs in our family, diabetes runs in our family, high blood pressure runs in our family, obesity runs in our family. Knowing that is one thing. Doing something about that to reverse that generational trend is something completely different. There's no pork in the collard greens, no pork in the stream beans, no pork in the cake. But we do have pigtails in South. <laughs> When we look at the consumption of comfort foods, or as we call it, soul food, this is a way of coping with stress. Food is a constant in our culture, and that's how we express love, happiness, sadness, put food on the table. Being a woman and being black, there was just so little room for error. When I would walk into corporate America, people were instantly wondering if I was just there to fulfill a quota. The best anesthesia that most people find are drugs and alcohol. And our family is food, but in most places it's drug and alcohol. You don't want to do drugs and you don't want to drink and you don't want to smoke, but you can eat a brownie. It's quick and it's easy and it temporarily makes you feel better. We're weathering because of that stress that we live under that's associated with racism and discrimination and the behaviors that we engage in to help us cope. The women in my family have died from obesity-related disorders. I kind of push it out of my mind, honestly. You don't want to go to a family gathering and just imagine people who are going to die because their body size. It's scary. I had sleep apnea. At 23, I had high blood pressure. I was pre-diabetic. Poor quality food. It's a part of our lifestyle because it's what we have the easiest access to. That's what we saw our parents eat, that's what we see our friends eat, that's what's in our neighborhood. When it comes to racial disparities in health, your zip code has a lot more to do with your health than your genetic code. You drive through any black community in this country and you'll see check cashing places, liquor stores, what you won't see are supermarkets to sell fresh fruits and vegetables. Highway 676 destroyed our city. It had a tremendous impact on businesses, services, all those things it takes for a community to survive, and left the poor behind helpless. African Americans are 79% more likely to live in neighborhoods that pose an environmental health threat than whites, where there are facilities that release pollution. Communities that don't have access to quality health care. Where there's industrial sites that have been abandoned. Communities that don't have access to open space and parks where people can exercise. All sorts of environmental hazards, including crime. We have been dying because we can't get the normal health. We have an enormous amount of resilience and endurance to just contend with so much. I got trust. Yes. Yeah. Oh. 
every day I'm amazed. I say, wow, wow. In this film, we'll meet people who have made change in their personal lives, who have transformed their communities, who have made changes through the policy process. Just as there's proof all around us that we have this cycle of death, there's also proof all around us that we can make change, that we can break that cycle. My doctor turned me toward education, thank goodness, because so many of my family have suffered and died uh, prematurely from these diseases. And thank goodness for this support group. No community should be poisoned. In the fights that we wage, they are not sprints, it's, these are marathons. We can choose to live as opposed to accepting a fate of death as if there is nothing that we can do about it. So Dr. Laviz, that that was quite a piece. And I can tell you um, my experience of the film is that it could apply to many neighborhoods that are similar to Brownsville. Um, but I'd like you to have some discussion about it before I ask you questions. Yeah, well, you know, the 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 project, the series, is really a national series, and we're shooting in other cities. Like the next episode is on environmental justice, and we're shooting that in Virginia and in Louisiana. And so, you know, we want the series to have a national feel. But you know, um, this particular episode is based in Brownsville because it's based on one of the chapters from my book, uh, which is about this, as you saw in the film, the story about me reading in the New York Times that. Brownsville had the lowest life expectancy. And believe it or not, that shocked me, even though it really shouldn't have, you know, given that I've, you know, been writing papers and doing research on this very topic. But I never thought about my neighborhood. But when I saw that and I saw Brownsville, I mean, that that made it um, that made it personal because that's that's my community. That's where I grew up. Well, before um I start with any questions, I want to find out if Anybody else on the panel has some comments or questions before I start my thing with the questions I have? Dr. Salafu? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Demisi, and uh, for introducing Dr. Levis so nicely, and uh, Dr. Levis for a wonderful contribution to this program. Uh, Dr. Levis is a very good friend of SUNY Downstate. Uh, whenever we call upon him to uh, open our eyes, he comes and he really dilates with our pupils and gives us new ideas. And it's just a joy always listening to him and listen to the program. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Dr. Patu is my uh, partner in the program uh, for transport. I believe he will share the same uh, sentiments. Uh, we thank you so much. Um, my question to you has to do with, um, in a place like uh, Brownsville, um, we understand what you've told us. Uh, we also understand uh, the definitions of these terms of uh, institutionalism and in terms of being personal. And uh, there was another category uh, which was um, eternalized racism. Those were the three categories of racism. Uh, and every day, every day that is happening in Brownsville. So how do we actually get to resolving this? Do we have to break down the neighborhood and rebuild it in a different way? Do we have to move people out and make it a different neighborhood? Have to um, bring in uh you know, a whole new set of uh, school system to that neighborhood. What is the actual solution that we can promulgate in order to bring relief to these kinds of communities, not just uh, Brownsville, but communities like Brownsville? Well, I mean, well, thank, thank you for the question. I mean, I, I would say that, you know, Brownsville is illustrative of an issue that is not in any way an issue of Brownsville. It is a national issue. 
And um, I think the, I mean, Brooklyn in general, um, everything, uh, virtually everything uh, in that film could apply to Lapwish, bed um Red Hook. I don't know, when I was growing up, uh, some of those neighborhoods, they seem to have changed quite a bit since when I was coming up. But, you know, those, these, these issues are national issues. I live in New Orleans now, and I, th I think that this, this film equally applies to the conditions here. So this is a national issue. It's not just about Brownsville, but we focused the episode in Brownsville to tell the story. And you know, I, I think that we, we're gonna have to reckon with the fact that we have a society that at its foundation is inequity. I mean, there's no place that you can stand in this country and not be standing on land that was appropriated from the indigenous people that lived here who were killed and murdered to take that land, right? So there's really, there's really no place in this country that is not um, also um, you know, benefiting and also being harmed by the inequities that is at the core of the foundation of the country. So do we go back um, you know, to the 1600s and try to start over again? I mean, obviously that's not, that's not realistic. So I don't think that the solution here is to, you know, dismantle communities like Brownsville. Um, I think the solution is to, you know, ensure that communities have the infrastructure, they have the resources that are necessary to have a healthy community. So when you think about what do you need to have a healthy community? You need to have people feel that they're safe, that their physical safety is intact. You need to have a legal economy that allows people to get jobs and support themselves and, and you know and be able to feed pay for their families, feed themselves and their families. You need to have housing that does not contribute to the health problems that people are living with. And that really applies to every single neighborhood in this entire country. It's the same exact infrastructure that's needed. So it's the act and, uh, and you need to have communities where you don't have uh, that are not overly ag aggressively policed, right? You need to add that to the equation as well. So it's the absence of that infrastructure that causes the problems in communities like Brownsville. And as we've seen, because when I was a kid, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Fort Greene, Flatbush, East, especially East Flatbush, these were all neighborhoods that were just as challenged as Brownsville. And they've all changed now. And why have those neighborhoods changed? because there was an infusion of those resources. There was an infusion of resources that led to better quality food, improvement in the quality of the housing, better schools. You go down the line and now the police police differently in, in Fort Greene than they used to when I was a kid coming up. So how do you fix Brownsville? You infuse Brownsville with the same resources that you've infused Fort Greene, that you've infu infused you know, parts of Bed Stuy and other parts of, of Brooklyn and other parts of this country. Uh, um, I would say um, that there are some challenges with the infusion, only because in Bed Stuy, where I grew up, once you infuse those resources, the color of the population tends to change. And so the question is, it's not a question I expect you to answer, mm -hmm. but the issue becomes how do we infuse but maintain the population? Um, and that, that's a larger question um, for us to think about. It's not to be answered today. Um, Dr. Demisi, do you have a question you'd like to ask? But, but can I respond to that a little bit? Sure. But, you know, so you're, you're right. So what happened in those neighborhoods I named was, was gentrification. You know, black community was basically displaced, and 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 a whole new set of people came in along with those resources. So, where you see communities in this country where African Americans are living in thriving communities, they are communities with those resources, right? So it's not the color of the skin of the people that lives there. It's people in any community need to have a functioning set of uh, a functioning infrastructure that supports a healthy lifestyle. And it doesn't matter whether it's an all black community or a Native American community or a white community, 
it's going to have the same issues. And so I think if we were to bring those resources to Brownsville, people would respond differently. People would act differently. And even if you didn't move the people out, conditions would improve. Okay. That's, uh, you know, I will, I will, you know, give into your word on this. Um, but there's a lot of discussion about the impact of gentrification, oh, yeah. um, and it, it crossed all crossed many fields. Real estate being one of the major ones, and mm -hmm. again, uh, opens our, us up to a much larger discussion. Um, but uh, Dr. Demisi, did you have a question you wanted to ask? No, I don't have. Uh, actually, I learned a lot about Brownsville, so thank you. I really appreciate the, the, the film and the presentation. Uh, so it, it's good. I, you know, I want to go and see Brownsville and learn more about the health, the healthcare infrastructure, in particular the, you know, the federally qualified healthcare centers because. Uh, they were they are doing really good stuff for COVID, but Absolutely. this film actually gave me a, a very nice cross section of Brownsville. And thank you for the film; I really appreciate. It. Okay, so the first of the questions we'll ask is: What are common misconceptions people have about African American health? And how can we combat those, these misconceptions and communicate more effectively? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for that question. I, I'd say there, there are two things that I that I would say in response to that. Two myths that I you know I've spent a lot of time trying to respond to. And uh, the first myth is that race disparities is is caused by poverty and social class, that it's really not a race issue, it's a social class issue. And the second one is that racial disparities are the result of biological or genetic differences between race groups. Um, and so first, let's deal with the social class one. Well, I mean, that's the easiest one to dispel. I mean, the data clearly shows that even among the most highly educated people with the highest income, that there are still race differences and health outcomes. So clearly social class is a piece of this problem. Lower income people have worse health outcome. No question about that. And a larger percentage of African-American is of a lower income compared to whites. And we know there's a whole history that explains why that's the case, right? 400 years of ex explanation there. Um, but even among African-Americans who are highly educated, who do have you know, good incomes, um, I struggle to get them to understand that there is still a racial disparity and that their health outcomes are still not as good as white people with, or, 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 or Asian Americans who have similar levels of education and, 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 um, and income. That's, that's one of the biggest struggles I have, especially when I'm talking to African Americans. The other issue is that there's you know, this idea that there are biological differences between race groups. And you know I've gotten into debates with people who try to argue that there is, when I ask them for the evidence, they're never able to provide the evidence. At best, what they can provide is things like, well, um, I was recently shown someone who talk, talk, talked about the uh, difference, race differences in bone density and made an argument that African-Americans have higher bone density. And I said, well, you're looking at the average averages and you're comparing averages and you see two different averages. I said, well, let's look at the distribution. And when you distribute bone density across by race, you'll see that there are lots of African-Americans with very high bone density, lots of African-Americans with very low density, lots of whites with very high bone density, lots of whites with very low density, and there's a tremendous amount of overlap between the distributions. So there is nothing, no biological um, aspect of human hu humanity that, that belongs only to one race group. There are no there are no race specific genes. There are no race specific uh, gene alleles or any other you know, aspects of our genetics. Um, and I think that that's a diversion from focusing on the fact that we've got a 400 year history of racism and inequity that placed African-Americans at disadvantage. And 
if we anything that I think detracts from that conversation is a distraction. And I think that, that the biological argument is a distraction. Well, that, that certainly is so. And what we know about the various social class arguments is that it doesn't appear that that's true either, um, given the fact that people like Serena uh, Williams could get health care that did not meet her needs during the time that she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, the, it's something that there's more to it than that. And whether there was a situation of implicit bias in her case, whether the doctor wasn't listening, whatever, what we know is that people who are very wealthy, who have skins of color, may be getting the same level of health care that those who do not get. So again, a large discussion can be had about that. Um, the next we have, um, sorry, we have a question um, from the attendee. They want to know how long did Dr. Levise take to complete the documentary? Uh, too wow. long, <laughs> too long, because I had no idea what I was doing when I started. I know it would be a lot faster now. Um, let's see. Um, I think it took about four years. Wow. Um, but I wasn't working on it every day for four years. Don't get me wrong. Uh, so I mean, it was off and on and doing it between other projects. But it, it probably took about four years. I, I, now I could do it a lot faster. I know I know a lot more. Well, we're happy that you persevered. <laughs> that, that's for sure. Um, and hopefully uh, in the future, this can be used as a training um, module for many people who want to address issues of health. In particular, I'm interested in the traumatic um, issues and the issues that inform mental health functioning. Yes. Um, but to our next question, uh, what is the question you're most tired of hearing on this subject? And what would you like to say about it so you never have to hear it again? <laughs> well, I kind of answered that already. It, it was it's it's the it's the biological difference question, and it's the um, um, the social class issue. Okay. I'd love to not have to make that explanation again. That you know we're not going to find a pill that's going to solve health disparities. This is not. There's not going to be a surgery that we can perform that's going to address health disparities. That's not. That's not the genesis of the problem. Okay. Um, so what advice would you have for medical students and faculty as they address the health issues confronted by our community? Yeah, trust your instincts. Trust your instincts. Especially if you're from the communities that you're serving, your, your nuanced understanding of your community's culture is an important and relevant expertise and trust that even though your, your, your instructors, your teachers, you know, in, in training may be telling you that what you know to be true isn't true, trust your instincts. Now, the re but you gotta be smart now because, you know, especially when you're in training, you've got to realize that you're in a, you're in a vulnerable position as a student and as a resident, and you can't always, you know, speak your mind if, you know, or actually you can speak your mind if you speak your mind, correctly there's a way to do there's always a way to make a point but you have to be smart about how you make those points but you have to trust your instincts there's a lot of misunderstanding around african americans and and some of that misunderstanding is among african americans themselves and certainly you know among people that may look like you but don't necessarily have the same sensibility or have you know interpreted the data that they've been given the same way uh, but you've got to trust your instincts um, what are some of the ways people from your field are making a difference in the world? Aside from you making this film and sharing your information with us in this very generous way. Well, um, the way that people in public health are making a difference in the world? Um, I it think could be people in health, people... Um, I mean, you mentioned that most of your friends are not within uh, the health, you know, environment. So I'm sure that you meet people that you think are making some impact even on this topic. 
uh, but they don't necessarily have to be in the field of health. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot that uh, that people are doing to make a difference. Um, I mean, I've always, I was, you know, um, when I talk about public health to people that are not in the health sciences, I tell them that, yeah, you may not know much about public health, and that's because you don't notice public health until something goes wrong, right? So you don't thank anyone for not getting polio, right? It doesn't occur to you to thank that, them or that you know you didn't fall down a flight of stairs because someone set a policy uh, and created guidelines on what the proper height of stairs need to be and or that the handrails. So most of what we do go unnoticed and until something goes wrong, you, you, you don't notice. So I think there's a lot that we do in public health that makes a difference, improving the, the quality of the air and the water uh, that we depend on that's those are public health measures, uh, and they're measures that you know you, you don't even think about. And my final question would be, uh, what has helped you to become as influential as you are to um, come to the forefront in the field? How how did Dr. Levine get to be Dr. Levine, and to evidence all the strengths and the insights you have? about community, et cetera. Yes. <laughs> Pam, Pam I, I don't know. I, I really don't know the answer to that question. I, I'm just, you know, when I, I was in graduate school and um, so my, my, my story is after college, I went back to New York. I went away to college in Maryland. After I finished college, I went back to New York. It was the 1980s. And my first job was uh, as a social worker and I was working in um, in the Bari as a social worker, um, working with homeless people. And back then you had HIV and you had homelessness and you had crack cocaine at all. If you remember the 80s, you know, I know a lot of you are not old enough to remember the 80s, but I was there. And in the 80s, New York was just decimated by homelessness, crack and HIV, uh, the new drug, new disease that we had, didn't even know how it was transmitted at that time. And so if you were working with homeless people, you were working with crack users and you were working with people with HIV, right? That was just what that was. And after doing that for a while, I, I wanted to go back, I decided to go, to go back to school to get a graduate degree with the idea that I would use that degree to learn what was going on. Why was, why was the, in the community having all these problems. And that's what I went to school to try to learn. And when I got to graduate school, I discovered that there was this thing called public health, which I didn't even know existed uh, before I went off to school. And when I discovered that, I, I found my calling. You know, I, I learned that African-Americans live sicker and die younger than every other ethnic group in the country. And I became fascinated by that question. And because logically I couldn't figure out why that would be. And I wanted to understand it. And um, so when I went into, over to the public health school to try to, try to learn that, discovered that they didn't know. And not only did they not know, there just weren't many people even trying to figure that out because it just wasn't an important enough question back at that point. This, was, this would have been the mid 1980s. And so I just decided that I would devote my career to trying to answer that question. Why do African-Americans live sicker and die younger? And what can we do about that? And so I think if I was to say, if there's anything that I would say, it would have to be, in answer to your question, it would be the fact that I found a problem that motivated me, that I felt was worthy of being life's, your life's work. And then I just kind of stuck to it and just continued to try to address that one issue. How do we address this issue of racial disparities in health and improve the length and quality of life of uh, my community. Well, I want to thank you for pursuing that particular road. Um, I want to thank you for continuing to contribute to the work of Transport, Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, SUNY Downstate. Um, I know um, you may not realize how much um, your, your talks and your presentations have influenced what we think about and what we do. 
and I hope you'll be willing to come back at some time in the future. Um, we want to know about the rest of the series when it gets done. And um, again, thank you so much for being with us this evening. And before you go, I'm giving everybody on this panel one last chance. Any other questions? Okay, they're silent. And to that, <laughs> I will say we'll, we'll bring this evening to a wonderful end. And thank I'm you. clapping. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitations. And, you know, Downstate is my, um, it's like my, 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 uh, my elementary school is just a few blocks away. Yeah. So uh, Sunny Downstate is home. Thanks. Okay. All right. Very nice. And I want to also at this time, uh, since we really didn't have a chance to do it, I want to make sure that Dr. Elkie, Dr. Walker, um, Dr. Patu, um, Dr. Gore, everyone who participated in this evening's event and certainly our audience. Um, understands the appreciation we have for your listening to this important information. And um, we'll be talking more about it as we go, as we end this year and go into 2021. So good Thank evening, you. everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Yes. Good to Thank see you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Jasmine. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank good you. Evening. Good evening. Moro, good evening. Have a good evening, Dr. Ignisi. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, thank you.